Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desire perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph, who no longer controlled himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of the Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so his name were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And, not, and, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are far five more years in which there will be neither towing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father of two Pharaoh, and lord of, he, of, of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not leave me. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide you for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own 
own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us read the Psalm 133, response. Oh, how good and pleasant it is when brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head that runs down upon the beard, upon the beard of iron, and runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing, life forevermore. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israel and descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable, just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience. So they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now, now receive mercy. For God has the Christian all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Will be uprooted. 
every plant that my heavenly Father, but let them alone. They are blind guides and the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman, woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. Daniel Defoe, 
some more than 100 years old, others like the adventures of Robinson, Robinson Crusoe, which must have been my dad's, 75 or 80 years old. The house I grew up in had several rooms with more and more bookcases, a parent's bedroom, the family room, the living room. Well, I inherited that gene as well. Now, with five children, I'm sure you can imagine that dinner time could sometimes be a little bit chaotic. And occasionally we had like a family fun dinner. Now, that did not mean we could throw food around the table or, or be rude in any way. What that meant was that each of us was allowed to bring a book to the table and we could read through dinner without getting in trouble. Everyone talked about the newest book they were reading like it was their new best friend. I remember a, one book that my mom told me about. It might have been 20 or maybe even 30 years ago. It was a book about God. Now, of course, I don't remember every book she's ever told me about, but I do remember this one because I found it to be fascinating. This book was based on the premise that God had evolved just as humankind has. And we know this, according to the author of that book, from the stories of the Bible. In God's infancy, God threw temper tantrums, kicked Adam and Eve out of paradise, wiped out everyone except Noah and his family. Like a hormonal teenager, God raged and lashed out, smiting entire armies. There was lots of mayhem and destruction in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament, like some of the more violent video games that are out today. And then, as we get into the New Testament, now we see that God has matured and mellowed. God and Jesus have become kind, compassionate, healing the sick, empowering the marginalized, befriending tax collectors and prostitutes, turning the other cheek. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? Pretty bad theology I've learned since then. But at the time, I found it something serious to contemplate. It sort of made sense to me then. And so whenever we come to this story, whether it be in Matthew or Mark, that book that my mom told me about comes to my mind. It makes me think, is this Jesus and his teenage days? Surly, dismissive, downright rude to some poor woman whose daughter is possessed by demons. It makes me wonder. Now, I do try to remember at all times that I'm both a sinner and a Christ follower, but this story, I have to say, makes me cringe inside when I ask myself, is this the Christ that I follow? Back to the story we heard today, for some reason, Jesus has intentionally chosen to walk through hostile, enemy, Gentile land. Our scripture doesn't really tell us why. My guess is that he needed a break. A day off, a long weekend at the beach, a sabbatical. He was going from town to town, teaching, healing, exercising demons, squabbling with the Pharisees and scribes, instructing his disciples, feeding the multitudes. And it seems like every time he went off somewhere to pray, people followed him. Maybe this is the reason that he chose to walk to the land of the Canaanites. At least as long as he was there, he could almost guarantee that he would not be followed. He could be fairly certain that he would have a moment to himself to think, to pray, to reflect. But it was a pretty brave thing to do. The Canaanites and the Jews were enemies. Walking down the road with his disciples, Jesus is accosted by a Canaanite woman. Now this is a, is a triple no-no. First of all, she's a Gentile. She's of a different religion. And she's a female, unaccompanied, no less. Furthermore, knowing, both knowing both of them knew that these social barriers existed, the woman didn't even have the decency to discreetly whisper in his ear or ask in a hushed tone of deference. No, it said she shouts at him loudly and often. Now, I have to say, at this point, I have to take up for Jesus. 
As I was growing up, no one in my home ever shouted. They even raised their voice. And it's not something I've ever been very comfortable with. Now, I'm not saying that that's anything remotely normal. It just happens to be my life experience. And as a result, I really, I hate being shouted at. Regardless of how passionate this woman was, how frightened, I can imagine that Jesus' first instinct was not to help her. So he simply ignored her, as though she wasn't worth his time or attention. The cast even a glance at her, to acknowledge her as another human being. Now maybe we might find this understandable if it were to be money changers in the temple or for the Pharisees and scribes with whom he often quarreled. This woman, however, addressed him as the son of David and begged for mercy on behalf of her demon-possessed daughter. A woman, a mother, a tortured parent, a mother who was unable to cure or help her own child. Now, isn't this a classic example of the marginalized and downtrodden people that Jesus was constantly seeking to lift up and heal? If I didn't know this story already, I would have bet the farm that he would have compassion for her. That he would have done something to alleviate her suffering and the suffering of her daughter. Immediately, lovingly, respectfully, this is the Jesus of Nina. Well, as for that bet, I would have lost the farm. Many times I've said from this place that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. It's being ignored. Jesus did not respond in a loving way. Jesus must certainly have been having a very bad day. The disciples didn't help at all. Well-intentioned, but they were often clueless. And they encouraged Jesus to send her away. They, too, were annoyed that she continued to follow them and to shout. Eventually, Jesus did decide to answer her, but it was rude and disrespectful. I won't help you, he said. You're the wrong color. You're the wrong religion. You're the wrong gender. Jesus must have stopped in order to answer her, for the next thing you hear is that she knelt before him. She begged. Now, which of us, sitting here or listening to this reflection, would not do the same for a loved one? A child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling? Is there any one of us who would not beg to save the person we love the most? Jesus' response to her was even worse than the first time. He insulted her. Calling her a dog was extremely derogatory. Jews often used this term to insult the Gentiles. Some of you may remember a few weeks ago, I said that when we draw a line between us and others, we will always find Jesus on the other side. Well, what about now? Where do we find Jesus now? Prejudice and hatred are not new, and they are persistent, whether we look halfway around the globe or in our own backyards. What can we do to minimize the intolerance of difference? I want to remind us all that Jesus was ethnically, religiously, and culturally a Jew, and as such, he grew up in a society of persecuted people who believed that the Gentiles were their enemy. Even so, where we sit now, 2,000 years later, that doesn't ever make it right to allow hatred and prejudice to continue. In our Christian faith, we say that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Well, I think nothing else in the story tells us that Jesus was indeed fully human a product of his environment and culture, just as we are. Jesus perhaps had not fully sorted through the fullness of his ministry and his relationship to God before this encounter. And maybe, just maybe, 
God used this Canaanite woman to help Jesus recognize the magnitude of God's love for all of God's creation. Maybe, just maybe, she was for Jesus in this moment, the word of God, in the same way that today Jesus is for us, helping us to know the profound love God has for us as God's beloved children. Perhaps it was this foreign woman who helped Jesus to understand his missional call. In spite of Jesus' insult and disrespectful demeanor, the woman persisted. Her daughter's life was at stake. She did everything she knew how to do. She begged for mercy. She shouted at Jesus in a loud voice. She was persistent. She followed him until she got a response. The minute Jesus stopped, she ran to kneel before him in a posture of humility and subservience, clarifying their cultural and religious differences in using this title, Son of David. Jesus insulted her, and she did not respond in kind, nor did she turn tail and leave in defeat. Jesus insulted her again, this time in a way that was even more demeaning. She would not be silenced. She was his teacher. She helped him clarify his call on the nature of his ministry. Then, and not until then, did Jesus offer her mercy and heal her daughter. Well, really, what else could he do? For even the Canaanite woman knew that God said, and Jesus had earlier echoed, I, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It is God's nature to be merciful, and therefore it is Jesus' nature as well. We often think of terms and mercy of lack, life and death matters, as in sparing someone's life or saving someone's life. We aren't often in a position to impact the world so profoundly. So I would invite us to reflect upon this for a moment. What exactly does it mean to have mercy? Well, mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who it is within one's power to punish or harm. Mercy is a loving response. But what else might it look like? What can we do to live more merciful lives? But we have to make an active decision that this is how we choose to live. You know that woman who's in the grocery line in front of you with three or four unruly, mouthy kids, dirty hands all over everything, and they're wanting to talk to you all the time and ask you questions? We've all been there. Mercy might look like withholding that exasperated, loud sigh at that hairy woman. Or that guy that hurries to get out in front of you on the expressway and then drives 10 miles under the speed limit. After you slam on your brakes and you finally get around him, perhaps mercy looks straight ahead instead of looking over and glaring at him. Mercy might look patiently and offer encouraging words when someone is struggling to speak a language that's not the one they learned to speak as a child. Mercy helps others to succeed. Mercy makes people feel more than instead of less than. Mercy creates safe environments for people to make mistakes, to learn and grow. To be merciful might be to forgive quickly, easily, and completely. To be merciful might be to give someone the benefit of the doubt. There are hundreds or thousands of small, fleeting moments in our lives that we can choose to respond and act mercifully. At this time in my life, most of my sins fall under the category of failure to have mercy. I wonder, is that the same for you? Because what we know about mercy is that we have the opportunity to build up instead of tear down. The way we use our facial expressions, our tone of voice, our body language can show that we value the dignity of 
a number of God's children. We can be in search of those who need help instead of turning a blind eye. Mercy gives us the chance to heal the community like Jesus did. Am I showing mercy? Is a great question that I hope we'll all focus on, especially during these difficult days of COVID-19. We have great teachings. Today we heard about Joseph, merciful to his brothers. We heard about Jesus who healed the daughter of a Gentile woman. We heard, we heard about God who never forsakes us. I want to become more like them. Do you? Amen. At this moment, I would like to invite um, a guest to speak with us today. Luca Guzman has asked to speak to this community. Now, I know that um, many of you who are listening are bilingual, and Luca will present his testimony in Spanish. For those who do not speak Spanish, uh, later this afternoon there will be a link with the um, English translation posted on our website on our Facebook page. I'm sorry that's not available to you right now, but I ask you to give your attention to Luca Guzman. Thank you. Días, todos ustedes. Quiero iniciar este breve testimonio con mucho agradecimiento. Primeramente, a Dios nuestro Señor, a mi esposa, a mis hijas, a mi hermano Luisito, a mi familia. Un agradecimiento a Madre, a Madre Laura. Mi agradecimiento a todos ustedes, a mi familia en Cristo Jesús, a la congregación de la iglesia de la Piento, a las hijas del Rey. Agradezco a toda la clase 7981 de la preparatoria de Carlos Salazar Ceballos, a mis amigos pastores, pastor Moisés, padre Jack, padre Gerardo a Madre Elizabeth, tus hijos, mis amigos de Pegasel, a la Peña, a Rafael, a Kevin, a Brandelina, a Lupita Salazar. Bueno, mi agradecimiento para todos mis amigos. Por último, le agradezco al COVID-19. Dios Padre, le agradezco por mi sanación, a mi esposa, a mis hijas, a mi hermano Luis, por tanto amor hacia mi persona, a Madre Laura por estar tan cerca, por tanto tiempo dedicado a mi persona, a ustedes, mis hermanos en Cristo Jesús por sus oraciones y sus mensajes de aliento. A todos mis compañeros, a todos mis amigos, por estar presentes en estos momentos, los más difíciles de mi vida. Le agradezco al COVID-19, a este bicho maldito, por darme la oportunidad de mantener y estrechar una relación de amor, de comunión, de glorificación, de bendición con Dios, nuestro Señor, de sentir su presencia de una manera increíble. Declaré su grandeza en los momentos que más fui atacado por este virus. Fueron semanas en las cuales Dios Padre puso los medios para mi tratamiento al doctor Franco Petancourt y sus medicinas antivirales previamente comprobadas con pacientes con casos clínicos de alto riesgo de COVID-19. Gracias mi Dios, gracias doctor Petancourt. Pasamos los días 
y mi situación, aunque estaba bajo control, me indicaba que algo terrible estaba sucediendo. El doctor me explicaba que el bicho atacaba de diferentes maneras, tanto que la ciencia estaba desconcertada. Mi cuerpo se extinguía poco a poco, perdiendo peso cada día. Mi mente trabajaba al 200%. La ansiedad me atrapaba y en cada momento yo clavaba más y más al Dios de Abraham, al Dios de Isaac, al Dios de Jacob, al Dios de amor que hemos conocido durante toda nuestra vida juntos. Yo sabía y entendía que todo lo que estaba sucediendo en ese tiempo de mi enfermedad no tenía ninguna comparación con el sufrimiento y el calvario que tuvo Jesucristo en obediencia en la cruz. Pero mi debilidad humana me hacía quebrarme, pues no miraba ninguna luz al final del túnel. Les confieso que nunca imaginé una escena así en mi vida, aunque también de eso le doy gracias a Dios. Siento que mi vida tomó valor, el valor que representa la confianza y la fe de saber y entender que nuestro Dios Todopoderoso nos dará solo lo que podamos soportar, porque su amor es inmensurable. Estuve durante aproximadamente 10 días sin dormir me hacía sentir tan mal, pues Olga mi esposa y Olga mi hija estaban también cargando mi cruz. Y era desesperante para mí verlas sufrir por el gran amor que les tengo. Yo sabía que ellas estaban sufriendo, aunque nunca, nunca lo demostraron. Me hice amigo de madrugadas del cantante Jesús Adrián Romero y la alabanza me daba fuerzas me hacía sentir más y más la presencia de Dios clamaba a él con mi fe y con la esperanza de que el momento de mi enfermedad tanto física como mental terminara mis hermanos Quiero compartirles que al Dios que juntos conocemos nunca, jamás, en el peor estado de mi aflicción, le renegué. Yo sabía que su misericordia y su amor son más grandes y omnipotentes que cualquier bicho insignificante como el COVID-19. Aunque justo habían pasado los 14 días sugeridos de duración del COVID-19. Mi situación empeoró. Empeoró exactamente el día que murió mi amigo Mario Maldonado. Ingresé al hospital con un dolor abdominal indescriptible. Creí que era el final. Olvida mi hija, estuvo pendiente de mí durante todo este tiempo. Tocaba puertas en las clínicas de día y noche, pues no quería llevarme al hospital y posiblemente volverme a exponer al COVID-19. Finalmente me recibieron y después de un examen, el doctor ordenó que urgentemente me trasladaran al hospital porque ningún, ninguna clínica tenía los medios para ayudarme con mi problema. En mi desesperación, en mi dolor, le pedía a mi amigo Mario que él que estaba en presencia de nuestro Señor y 
intercediera por mí que hablara con Dios para que el dolor se diera o que de una vez tuviera piedad de mí y me llevara a su presencia no podía más después de varios estudios en el hospital me aplicaron una dosis de morfina y finalmente pude dormir aproximadamente una hora y media al despertar me di cuenta que estaba todavía en este mundo también me di cuenta de que mi mente había regresado al punto donde siempre había estado con una tranquilidad y una paz que en muchos días no había sentido mis hermanos creo fervientemente que ese fue el inicio aunque paulatinamente donde fui sanado por Dios nuestro Señor gracias a mi imagen finalmente ahora completamente sanado solo le pido a Dios que su gracia continúe siendo derramada en mi familia en todos ustedes en mis amigos y que de la misma manera por su gracia continuaré realizando todos mis hechos todos mis actos de acuerdo a su santa voluntad te doy gracias, Dios Padre, Dios Hijo, Dios Espíritu Santo, porque ahora entiendo que nosotros, tus hijos, nunca somos más grandes que cuando estamos de rodillas y con los brazos abiertos ante ti, mi Señor Dios. Amén. Now let us say together um, our statement of faith, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, sorry, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God for God, light for light, true God for true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Please join me in the prayers of the people, form two, and during the time of silence after each petition, I invite you to add your own prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, for David, our diocesan bishop, and for Lori, our rector. We pray for this gathering, for the Scottish Episcopal Church, the Most Reverend Mark Strange, Primus of Scottish Episcopal Church, and Bishop of Murray, Ross and Cadence, and for St. Bartholomew, the Scorpus Beast, in Church of Good Shepherd in George West. Please um, pray for the church. We pray for our Episcopal Day School, Brian Lang, Director, Janet Reina, Director of Operations, and St. Paul's Episcopal Montessori School in San Antonio. Pray for all places of learning, especially our Episcopal and Anglican School. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, for Donald, our president, for Greg, our governor, and Trey, our mayor, and for the well-being of all people, for those serving in the armed forces, especially mine, Michael, Rico, and Noah. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. We lift up to you, Holy Lord, those many medical care workers, prayer responders, food suppliers, and all who are risking their lives for others during this pandemic, for the hospitals, shelters, and those places that have been converted into temporary medical and care facilities. We pray for your blessing upon them and all who are there being created for and caring for others. We are thankful for your holy healing, most merciful God, and for your presence with us. We pray especially for those on the front lines in this pandemic, Rosie Holmes, Santiago and Javier Nunes, Esli Hernandez, Kathy Morrow, Ignacio Lapsa, Monica Whitney, and Emily Wayne. Please join me now as we pray together the prayer for people facing great uncertainty. God, in the present moment, God, who in Jesus seals the storm and shoots the frantic heart, Bring hope and courage to all who work or wait in uncertainty. Bring hope that you will make them the equal of whatever lies ahead. Bring them courage to endure what cannot be avoided for your will is health and wholeness. You are God and we need you. Amen. We also live for prayers to you for full and complete healing for these people who have received a positive test for soul. Talitha Gray, the Reverend Jim Friedel, Ian Skill, Francisco Medrano, Gustavo Guzman, Chavo Flores, and Chacho Mata. Pray for all who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for Kirk, Charles, Sondra, Jill, Joe, Jean, Blanca, Keith, Leon, Yolanda, Estella, Chawa, Dora, Hilda, Adam, and Rebecca. 
for Connor, for Owen, and Emmett. Kelsey, for Ro Rosie Fullerton, the Rosberg family, Lise, Chad, Je Jesse, and Will Gain. Pray that they may be healed body, mind, and spirit. I ask your prayers of thanksgiving for Robert and Betty Swartner for their faith and service to you. Pray for those who serve as Christ's hands and feet in this world. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Jack Fullerton, Annabelle Ketan, and Fred Crossover. Pray, uh, pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that they that we may have grace to glorify, glorify Christ in our own way. Amen. Amen. For our concluding prayer, we'll use uh, this college written by John P. Rayner. When evil darkens, excuse me, when evil darkens our world, give us light. When despair numbs our souls, give us hope. When we stumble and fall, lift us up. When doubts assail us, give us faith. When nothing seems sure, give us trust. When ideals fade, give us vision. When we lose our way, be our guide, that we may find serenity in your presence and purpose in doing your will. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. I invite you to join me as we pray a, a prayer of spiritual communion, the act of reception. For those people who cannot be here with us today, in union, bless Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, 
for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on Him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Jason, the Lord Christ, the Lord God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. For those who are worshiping with us virtually, 
Let us pray the concluding prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness. And in the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom. Who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. And for those of us here present, eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. Thanks be to God. And the peace of God be always with you. And also with you.